Grace and peace to you from God our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. We do the Pauline greeting here. And so if you're a guest with us today, we want you to know there are no visitors. You were part of this congregation the minute you arrived. And we simply do the Pauline greeting, which is this. You know what to say in response. You don't have to come up with anything. It is peace be with you. And the response is? Let's stand and greet each other in Christ's name. prayer concerns um, are printed in your bulletin prayer requests if you have a prayer concern that you'd like to share with the staff or with the whole congregation please don't hesitate to let us know we'd be happy um, to pray we believe in the power of prayer in this church in addition to those lift listed I have a couple more um, please pray for Steve Lifesti's brother Eli he's having a lot of health issues and is hospitalized uh, we praise God that Wes Clark had a successful hip surgery and prayers also for Beth Rutland. She's part of our cancer support group um, and has requested prayers. Will you go to God in prayer with me, please? Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We pause and thank you for the many blessings that you've poured into our lives. So many that we just take for granted we thank you for the rain this morning. We know that all life is sustained by you, Lord. And so often we forget to pause and say thank you. We lift up prayer concerns for our church family to you, Lord. We know that you provide healing in ways that we can't even imagine. And that each healing is a miracle. So we ask you to surround those that are listed and those that are in our hearts with your healing presence, with your comfort, with your peace, that peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, how he taught us to live and love, how he taught us to have compassion and patience and gentleness. Help us to reflect this, these many characteristics to all we meet in our homes, in our jobs, just any time that we're out and about, that people may look at us and see the face of Christ and that we may look at them and see his face as well. Lord, we know that our church history is riddled with challenges and we continue to oppose slavery and discrimination to know that you created each one of us and you love every person in this world. So help us to embrace one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray all these things in his precious name as we share together the prayer he taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll be reading from both the Old Testament and the New Testament this morning. First, beginning in Proverbs 22, 7, and then Matthew 25, 14 through 30. The rich rule over the, the poor, and the borrower is the slave to the lender. For it is if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to each according to his ability. And then he went away. At once, the one who had received the five talents went off and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here is what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and I gather where I did not scatter. When you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Choir, beautiful. We're starting a parking lot ministry in terms of greeters, and Leanne Kona is going to start that, and I'm going to be the first volunteer. So I will go straight from the parking lot into worship now when it begins until we get enough volunteers. I can't ask you to do it if I'm not willing to do it myself. So when it's hot, I'll be out there dressed in appropriate clothing. When it's cold, I'll be out there dressed in more appropriate clothing. I, I will say when I do the, the, the memorial service or something outside, there are times when I'm thankful for this robe, and then June comes, and I'm not so grateful. But I want to tell you that because we're going to be asking you to sign up for that. I'm seeing the same ushers and the same greeters every Sunday. And I'm also looking out at people that could volunteer to help out with that. And I'm asking that you, had you, have you not yet been involved, please know that you're welcome and you're wanted and you're worthy. You have gifts to offer. So please know that if you're not signed up for any of those things, that's desperately needed right now. We're going to have a golf cart that will be running back and forth, but we need to greet and the other portion of that is it involves security, eyes and ears, from the exterior to the interior. 
So please know that if you've not yet signed up to be an usher or a greeter, we could really use you in the parking lot ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in spite of the nature of the presenter, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, your will is done in the words that are spoken this day. And all of God's church said. So this is an interesting piece of scripture in terms of stewardship. We work on four aspects of who we are as a church. And it's almost in a quadrennial nature. It's relationship, discipleship, mission, and evangelism. Relationship, your relationship to one another, your relationship to the world, and your relationship to Almighty God through Christ your Savior. Discipleship, how you plug in, where you plug in, what works for you, how you step out, how I step out with you. The next is mission and evangelism. And the first two drive mission to make us mission-minded, and the second drives evangelism which is a result of us celebrating the mission, but being stewards of the knowledge that we have. I say that to you today because this is a tough story to listen to. Now, depending on your commentary, it is going to say that a talent was 20 years wages to 15 years wages. One theologian says 16 years, excuse me, 16 years wages. But either way, that's a lot of wages to hand someone and have an expectation for them to do something. In other words, it's something of great value. And I submit to you today that your knowledge in Jesus Christ is of invaluable nature. That is to say that the knowledge you have is not predicated all the way through society because we live in what we call post-modernity. People do not know the scripture in a wider basis now than in the history of the church. Even those of us that grew up in the church, for some of us, it just wasn't taught at the same level. The 70s were kind of big life lesson stuff. I remember youth groups traveling to other churches to do musicals, and that would be their mission trip. I never figured that out. Even as a little boy, I'd watch my father, and they'd charter a bus. And in fact, they'd spend all that money, for those of you nodding your head in the 70s, and they were going to go perform somewhere, and that was a mission. And they were performing to the very people that were in another church. I never understood that. I guess they were doing the best they could, but I always asked my dad, I said, why did you do that? And I'll clean up his language a little bit. But we were in the backyard one day, and he smoked a cigar. And I said, what was the point of that? And he goes, shut up. I don't know. He goes, by the way, that answer works when you're my age for everything. Dad, why is it this way? Shut up. I don't know. But we do learn. I like that Nelda talked about what has occurred in slavery. My friend Brad Britton was the pastor at Mahaya years ago and somebody had made a comment to Brad that they'd never had racism in their church and he dug back into the 1800s where they so generously allowed the back two pews to be utilized by those that were not Caucasian. And Brad said, don't say that. We need to remember where we were. You've heard the words, those that don't know history and fail to learn it are doomed to repeat it. I'm not saying slavery's coming back. That's not the point. But we have different aspects of society that involve social justice where we have to be careful that people are enslaved by poverty. People are enslaved by a lack of motivation from generation to generation. Those are real issues we're having in our country right now. And we have to look up at that and say, well, where do we fit in as Christians? And where we fit in as those who have the knowledge of the talent, something incredibly precious or obligated by God to share it. And the question is, how do we share it? People come to church today for two reasons that are new. Social media, or they were invited. My mother-in-law, having been divorced, was invited to a church Christmas party, and a guy walked up and he said, hey, his name was Tim Russell. He said, I'd like to invite you to church. I heard you're a single mom trying to raise your little girl there. And she goes, yeah, but I'm not allowed. 
And he said, you're not allowed. She said, yeah, I'm a divorced single mother. And he said, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Y'all have heard of Willie Nelson, long red hair, smokes a lot of cigarettes. <laughs> if you go to Abbott, Texas, that church has been taken over by no one but Willie Nelson because he bought the church from our conference. Because in the midst of all the ushers telling this long-haired, cigarette-smelling, young man who was off tour and wanted a place to worship and at the Baptist church, yeah, I'm saying that online, so if you're Baptist, don't email me. I don't care. It's a real story. Ask Willie. Baptist usher looks at him and goes, son, where do you, you really don't need to come in here. You're not dressed and let's just leave it at that. He said, I thought I'd give it one more shot because I felt called by God to worship. And he said, I drove across Abbott, and there was that little white Methodist church sitting there. I pulled up and waited for somebody to challenge me, and the usher said, hey, boy, come on in. Come on in. When that property came up for sale, Willie Nelson said, no matter what they sell it for, I want it. If you see a Methodist church in Abbott, Texas today, it belongs to Willie Nelson. You see the power of what you have in stewardship you really don't consider. Tony Devoto asked me to go, invited me to come to his son's little league game, and I got to pray with that team. We always wonder what the reaction's going to be. You never know. You're going to get some hard liner who's constitutional right. Well, I'll leave it at that. Every one of the coaches bowed their head, took their cap off, and we prayed. You see, if we underestimate the world is willing to receive, we won't give them our gifts, will we? We've already predicated the response. We've already predestined what God can't do. And in fact, don't insult God by telling God what you're not capable of because you are capable of much more than you can imagine. But yet, we have doubts. Every one of us in God's creation at times has doubts about our character and our ability and how we'll be accepted or received. Will you say amen? There's not a person walking, regardless of how successful, has not experienced that. There was a couple trying to get into a high-end condominium complex. They had to be interviewed by a board of seven people sitting behind a table. And the lady said, we'd like to fill out an application. And the building manager said, well, they actually do that during the interview. A couple sat on the other side of the table and they were absolutely intimidated as these seven people stared them down. One man in the middle with a pen, he never made eye contact with them. He said, names, Mr. and Miss Smith, occupations, I'm an engineer, he's a teacher, children, boy and a girl, ages, seven and nine, animals, there was a silence, and the mother said, well, they're well-behaved. <laughs> that took you a second. <laughs> Quite often, we feel like we're in that interview, don't we? And we don't measure up. But it's the small things that make the difference in people's lives. We want some cataclysmic experience, or we want some absolute conceptualized magnificent and occurrence and I want you to look back at your own life the things that meant something to you and weren't many times the small things someone said to you such an encouraging result my wife was three years old when her mother got invited to that church she now has her doctorate in ministry and the theology of Wesleyan narrative counseling. You don't get much more Methodist than that. The theology of Wesleyan narrative counseling. That is to say, through the power of the Holy Spirit, not solution-focused, secular, not Freudian, the power of moving forward and sanctification with God helps us get past our challenges and move into a new life that God intends for us. And she would not be practicing today ministry had not a pastor looked at a lady while he ate an iced cookie 
at a Christmas party saying, well, you're welcome to this church. And my wife grew up knowing that you go to church because that's what we do and that's where we're accepted. Having been accepted herself. I went to that pastor's funeral and he administered to tens of thousands of people. There weren't 200 people there. But I remember after I cooled off thinking, you can't even invest in what he did in the world? That I think Tim Russell would say if he were alive today, well, maybe they're busy out inviting somebody to church over lunch. Maybe they had somewhere else to go. He had that good mindset. He looked at all the encouraging portions of it. I have a dear friend that He's gotten a lot better, but in his life, he was so negative. In 38 seconds, you could be having a great day. By the time he said what he needed to say to you about his outlook on life, you'd go, I'm okay. After he'd say, how are you? You've been around somebody like that before, where by the time they get done, 38 seconds later, you just kind of stand there and go, "Ah." or it's the person you run from. I watched a teacher this last week in an office, went to go pray with him, and I saw a parent coming, and apparently the only thing this parent ever has to say is something negative about the school, about the teachers, about the administration, and I watched this lady slowly go, I need to go back here. (laughs) You ever gone back there? Like you get around somebody and go, yucky, ah, but you don't, you just go, I'm going to go back here. Trudy talked about masking. We do mask that as we mask our insecurities. But I want to submit something to you today. You're sitting here because you have that talent. Do you know in the mid-Middle Ages, talents came from a form of currency to the word talent, which meant ability, extraordinary ability. Look at Krista. She can switch from the organ. She can switch to piano she ever starts preaching I'm going to come after her but it's a natural thing you look over and she's playing the organ I love the sound of piano I love the sound of organ I love the sound of the choir we didn't have a choir for a while you remember we taught Bible study one way and many of you kept coming which it's so fun to teach a Bible study when you can't ask a question I would look up and go, please blink your lights with this generic question and be like, if you two think God loves you, will you blink your lights? And they're sitting back there going. (laughs) I know it was discouraging. Christmas Eve, I remember looking at Thomas. I said, we're doing it outside. We're renting a stage. And Thomas goes, okay. Susie goes, we can work it out. By the way, I like to hear Susie speak. So anything she speaks, you know, it sounds very civilized. Church, you have that talent. We just had COVID and grew in the midst of COVID. That's you. That's determination. That's saying I'm more capable than I thought I was, even when I'm having a bad day. I share this with you because evangelism and stewardship and discipleship are all tied into one. It doesn't have anything to do with grabbing somebody by the lapels and going, do you know Jesus Christ? You know that feeling. You've been around those folks. It has to do with your mindset, your outlook, your attitude, knowing that you have the talent. I had a good meeting with a church official this last week. He's our district superintendent. Alito will not be touched. The system has changed dramatically. Part of it is because your pastor is incredibly obstinate. And that may not be a good thing at times. But the nature of understanding that we submit boundaries in who and how we are going to be is essential to how we function. You did it years ago through your persistence when church officials came in and were verbally abusive to you. And you kept going. 
When they were irresponsible, when they were antagonistic, you kept going. You said, we're stronger than this. We're better than this. You didn't have to say it. You actually did it, church. I researched you long before I came. Who you were, what you were about. And so I submit to you today, I'm going to ask you to consider what your specific talents are that God has given you. Because everyone I'm looking at has been given them in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and has a special way in which they can do it. I'm proud of one of our youth, apparently that confronted another youth the other day and said, you're not allowed to sit by yourself. You have to come sit with, and eat with us. I like that. You're not allowed to sit by yourself. You have to come sit with us. You're not allowed not to be invited to church. You come to this church. You're not allowed to walk in here. You smoke a lot of dope. You got long red hair. You're a hippie. It's 1964. Come on in, boy. You see the difference that makes? You are welcomed. But with that, you have a responsibility and the knowledge you have and the talents you have to share that love unconditionally with God's world. And so I ask you to consider this very week where it is in your life you need to examine the talents that you don't utilize in bringing someone to Jesus. Where it is in a world of post-modernity where church is foreign to many that you could plug in some way, shape, or form even in a conversation. One of the strangest things happens Nowadays, I'll ask somebody, how'd you find out about our church? I work with so-and-so, and they were just talking about it. We thought we'd come check and see what it was. Or the conversation I had with a young man who doesn't know the Old Testament Bible stories. Looked at our paintings and looked at the third one in line in the hallway, and he goes, what's that one? I said, that's Daniel in the lion's den. And he goes, yeah, I don't know that one. But let me ask you, where was he when he asked the question? Right here in church. Church, we have a new assignment in our discipleship. A brand new assignment. It's old yet new. It has a different way about it now. Mention that you're involved in a church. For those of you that have the fortitude to do that, it doesn't bother you. Invite someone that doesn't have a church home and if they feel discouraged, lift them up and let them know, in your faith, we encourage and we love and we embrace. We don't judge and point. I celebrate the fact that, folks, if Jesus were standing right here, I believe he would do the same thing. And he would encourage you that you have talents. The question he's going to ask is, are you willing to invest them are you willing to take a little bit of a risk? Or are you going to bury them in your heart and keep them only for yourself? If you do, just like the master of the story, they're not multiplied. They are nullified. Please consider that in your prayer life this week. If you will pray where it is and how it is that the Holy Spirit can lead you in guiding someone else, even in the smallest of ways, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you say amen? We give the invitation every time we meet. If you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, or you'd like to be baptized, or you'd like to join with this congregation, we ask that you consider one thing, is that you won't find a better group of people who are sinners just trying to get it right. That's a great ringtone, wherever it's coming from. You're good. I have to share this very quickly. I was at a funeral one time, and old McDonald had a farm, was playing, and the lady in front of me, whose purse it was in, refused to answer it by the third time it rang. And finally, I just went... E-I-E-I-O.
Let me ask you this. Would you rather your phone ring in church or out of church? Would you rather God see your phone in church? Amen? Praise God. Let's stand and sing our invitational hymn. Excuse me for a minute. I want to introduce you to the Cape family who is joining uh, by transfer of membership from Hannah never did join White's Chapel, but there's a Robins at White's Chapel too, by the way. I think there are six of us out in ministry out there. But Eric and Hannah have been coming. They sit on the right-hand side usually. Were you there today? Okay, I was trying to find you during the sermon. I couldn't find you. I got scared. Very good. I'm not going to ask you the five-fold membership vows because you've already done that. But I'm going to ask that as we partner with the Cape family and help raise their children in the faith, give them all help that they need no matter what, that you covenant with me as we celebrate and say together, praise God. Praise God. I extend the right hand to you. Welcome to the church. At Alito, Texas. Are you good? I'm going to ask the capes, if they would, to go ahead and head out so they could just reach you and congratulate you, if you don't mind, in the foyer just for a minute. It was the mugs, wasn't it? The limited edition mugs. Congregation, I want you to remember something. I don't care what happens to you this week or where you think you fail. I want you to remember this, church. Do you hear me? You began your week with seeking God's will for you in your life, no matter what. And nothing can separate you from that fact in Jesus Christ, your Savior. No matter what happens, no matter how you think you falter or fail, you began this week again in your life, turning yourself over in worship to God, and you could not have honored him any better. Please remember that this week. Be encouraged. Know that God loves you. Christ died for you, and God couldn't be any more proud of you. Yes, I went ahead and said it. You hear me? Right now in worship, God could not be any more proud of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we go out into the world, remind us, whether we believe it or not, you're not invested in how we feel or what we think, other than believing that you will direct us with our talents. Remind us that we are more capable than we give ourselves credit. Remind us that the small things we do or incredible results in building your kingdom and reminding us each and every day that we are called to play a part. May somehow, in some way, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we be directed subtly 
and directly at times to go out and make disciples. We ask these things, Lord, as we pray to do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's church said together, have a blessed week, church.